All right, so please stop me anytime you have questions. I have probably too many slides, so that's OK. We don't have to make it all the way through. We'll see how far we make it. Um, here's the outline. I will tell you a bit about general accelerating cavities, a bit about why we think SRF is pretty cool, a uh, very short walk through history, and then depending on how much time we have, some more general R&D examples. So let's start with accelerating cavities, normal and superconducting. The idea is always the same. Mostly these cavities are used to accelerate a beam to provide energy to charge particles. There are other applications, and I will show you some later on. Typical frequencies are some megahertz to some gigahertz. That again depends on the application. SRF cavities are typically around the gigahertz or so, but there are lower frequency cavities too. Highest gradient is nice for some applications, but for many applications, it's not the main goal. There are other constraints. Some are machine dependent, some are technology dependent, which actually can shift the operating point to far lower gradients of fields than we can achieve in principle. And in most cases, all the requirements are competing, so you have to pick a good operating point. So this was the basic principle, right? You have charged particles going through these metal boxes. Could be normal conducting, could be superconducting. You drive the oscillating fields inside, some eigen mode, which has normally two little electric fields, and that causes the beam to be accelerated if the timing is right. Now, to optimize such a structure is quite complex, and I can spend a half hour just walking through this diagram, which I'm not going to do. But basically, you have some machine parameters on the left that affect some of the cavity parameters, which then influences your cavity design, but also related things like quiet start design, the input coupler, which brings power into the cavity. So it's a very complex op optimization. And again, you can often not achieve all goals at once. So you have to find a good point in between all these requirements. There are two basic types. There's a standing wave cavity and a traveling wave cavity. In a standing wave, right, you have a wave going this way and a reflection. So you set up a standing wave, like a standing wave for a string, and then the field oscillates. And by then getting the timing right, you have these bunches of particles going through this. And if the timing is correct, they all get accelerated. In the traveling wave, the wave travels through the structure. So it comes in here, comes out again here. And phase velocity is the same as the particle speed here. So you have constant acceleration through the structure. SF cavities mostly uses this standing wave, though there are some attempts to build actually a traveling wave structure using SF technology. How these cavities look like is very different depending on the type of machine. Um, so there are pulse dynamics where the fields are only on for short periods, and then that repeats at some web rate. There are continuous Linux with low current, the high current machines like ELLs, the injectors, and then there are storage rings. And all of these have different requirements in terms of exploding field, the power which is needed to be transported to the beam, and also what we call higher mode damping. And I will talk a bit more about later on. So when the beam goes through the cavity, it drives all these higher frequency modes. There's an infinite number in these cavities and we need to suppress them. And again, how strong we have to suppress those depends on the kind of machine. So different requirements there. So as I mentioned, the main function for these cavities is to accelerate the beam, to provide energy gain. But there are other applications. Um, for example, there are third harmonic cavities where you go at three times the frequency, the normal frequency. They are used, for example, to change the bunch length. Could be longer, could be shorter. Um, they can be used to actually modify the energy spread along the bunch. That can be important for bunch compression, for example. Um, then there are transverse cavities. They kick the beam sideways. That is used, for example, in colliders. It's called crab cavities, which are used to increase luminosity. And I will show you one picture of that. And completely other application are SRF guns, where what you saw before, these guns are actually placed, or cathodes are placed inside an SRF cavity. So for storage rings, the cavities are pretty big usually. They look like this. This is the one we have in Caesar in the storage ring. A single cavity, one cell here. This thing is a waveguide which brings power into the cavity to excite the fields. Um, there are multiple reasons for these, obviously to accelerate the beam. 
but also to provide beam stability to increase what we call the quantum lifetime, how long the beam can go around before too much gets lost, things like that. The main challenge here is to deal with high currents. These storage rings usually have very high beam currents, so there are these higher mode effects are very strong. That's somewhat different than in cavities which are in used for long Linux, for long straight machines, no longer a ring. Um, here's a cavity which many of these machines are using. It's the one developed for Tesla a long time ago. Now the IRC or Flash or the European XFVL, they're all using this type of cavity. The ones we have here in the ER also look very similar. Um, these can be pulsed, these can be CW, depending on the machine. Some are pulsed, some are CW. Um, High gradients are typically used for pulse machines. For CW turns out, you typically run at lower fields because the cost optimum, once you take into account things like cryogenic cooling, actually forces you to run at lower gradients. Then is the crab cavity. So these have fields which actually kick the beam sideways. That can be used if you have collisions in the collider. You want to have, typically you have some angle here between the different beams coming in. And you can twist the beam so that you can increase actual luminosity. So they interact more with each other. And for that, you twist the beam sideways, back and forth. So that has been done in KKB, for example. That's how the cavity looks like in KKB. Well, here again, these so are transverse field cavities. They can look quite differently. So here's some other designs for the Large Hadron Collider, which in the future will have these crab cavities to increase luminosity. So they have more interaction between the beams. Um, they need fairly low frequency <laughs> cavities, and you can see they start to look very differently. Same ideas, it's a metal can, again, made of a superconductor niobium, but the shape is very different because there are different kind of modes inside the cavities are used to kick the beam sideways. These are cavities, SIF cavities, for lower frequency, uh, lower velocity beams. If you have ions, they typically move with less than the speed of light. So they are different than electrons in that respect. And again, the cavities used for these kind of lower velocities look quite differently. So this looks like a quarter wave here. The beam goes actually through here. So that's a quarter wave length here. So these are kind of modes or cavities you can use at low frequencies. So the physics is always the same. You have a superconductor. You have to deal with that. But the actual shape and the modes used depend on the application. These kind of cavities are actually used for quite a few machines for different applications. Um, for ion accelerators, there's, for example, in the future, maybe accelerator driven systems that is like a nuclear power plant where you actually use a drive beam to create nuclear reactions. Waste transmutation, energy production, intense polarized neutron sources, all of these use these cavities. Nuclear physics, defense applications, and so on. So they use more of these fancy looking cavities. But coming back to elliptical cavities, as I mentioned, you lose a mode which has a longitudinal electric field. So this here is a very simple pillbox-shaped cavity. And it turns out the lowest frequency mode has a longitudinal electric field, and that's the magnetic field going in a circle around the cavity here. This is called a TM010 mode. So when you work with these cavities, you will hear all this slang, transverse magnetic. And these numbers here tell you the number of zeros you have along the angle direction R and Z for, for three dimensions. So that's the nomenclature used. The cavities we mostly used are the elliptical, so the modes look somewhat different. So that's a cross section for the cell. Again, that's electric field, so the beam goes in this direction, C is the longer two electric field. That's the magnetic field, which on X is a zero. Most of our cavities not have only not one cell, but have multiple of these cells, like the nine cell structure shown here, like a coupled oscillator. But if n masses connected with springs, you get n modes. So if you look at the spectrum here for the accelerating mode, now you have nine of the TM010 modes. It's again like a coupled oscillator. You can model that with this LCR circuit here. And the coupling strength depends on these irises, how big they are. And they couple the cell, one cell to the next. We typically use the highest frequency of those, the so-called pi mode for acceleration. And that's shown here. In the pi mode, the phase flips from one cell to the next cell by pi. So if this points this way, that points the other way, 
So when the electron bunch here, the particles go through this, it takes a half a period to go from here to the next cell. So there's always the same field direction when the particles go through each given cell. So they're always getting accelerated along the cavity. So that's how multi-cell cavity works. We like to define this, what we call the exciting voltage. It's simply the maximum energy gain divided by charge. If you send a beam through the structure at the right time, the maximum gain per charge is the exciting voltage. And then we talk about the exciting field. It's simply the voltage oops, divided by the length of the cavity, the active length. That's from here to somewhere here. So the megavolts per meter we talk about, that is this electric field here. It's the energy gain per length, basically, per charge. The other figure of merits, there's something we call the shunt impedance here. That's voltage square divided by two times the dissipated power of a cavity. There's a quality factor, which is the frequency, omega 2 pi f times the stored energy over the dissipated power. Again, we talk a lot about this. We like this to be high, so small dissipated power for a given stored energy in the cavity. And then the ratio of these two is called the R over Q factor, which actually only depends on the shape of the cavity or nothing else. So when a beam charged particles go through such a structure, it leaves behind what we call wake fields. So it leaves behind some electromagnetic field, which oscillates. It's quite complex. And it has typically a very wide frequency spectrum. So what's shown here is the power left behind as function of frequency. And for typical parameters, like a bunch length here, this guy of a few picometer, uh, picosecond or so in time, these frequencies can go to hundreds of gigahertz. So even though our operating frequency is just a gigahertz or so, the bunches excite modes or fields up to tens or hundreds of gigahertz, very high frequency. And depending on how the current is, this can be quite a bit of power. For our EL, for example, we built over at Wilson Lab. These are hundreds of watts per cavity left behind. So this power has to go somewhere, and better not to the superconductor itself, because for each watt absorbed here at a quadrant temperature, we have to spend about a kilowatt of cooling power. So if that all will go to a 2K cryogenic system, that would be pretty much the end of it. So we have to make sure that the power travels outside the cavity and gets absorbed somewhere else, or picked up somewhere else. And that is done by what we call these HOM dampers. And then different approaches, the antennas we stick in at the end of the cavity. So here's the last of the cavity. And we stick in some antennas there to couple out the higher frequency stuff we don't like. This can also be waveguides, like shown here. Or sometimes we put absorbing materials between the cavities in the waveguides to just um, get the power, intercept the power. So why do I want to make this cavity superconducting, not normal conducting? So again, here is how the principle looks like. So for an SAF cavity, we typically nowadays use niobium, though it's part of the center we try to go to more advanced materials. Critical temperature is 9.2 Kelvin for niobium. So we have to cool them down at least to 9 Kelvin or so, typically 2 to 4 Kelvin. Then we excite these modes, our fundamental mode, to accelerate the beam, which is the lowest frequency eigenmode for each cell. So typically, that's half a gigahertz to 1.5 gigahertz. For some of these low frequency, um, low beta cavities for ions, they have low frequencies up to down to maybe 100 megahertz or so. And as I mentioned, we don't like these harder modes, the high frequency modes, so we have to suppress them. So the key is that by using SF materials, we can minimize the wall dissipation. So the power actually going to the walls of the cavity is very small. If you use SF materials, not zero, but it's small. And that actually gives you quite a bit of freedom. First of all, you can run at high fields. If you make it normal conducting, there would be so much wall heating at some point. If you run continuously, you would melt the copper or the cavity in most many cases. You have very high AC power efficiency. So in the best cases, and I will show you one example, you can get about 50% AC power to beam power efficiency. So it's a very efficient machine. And it gives you a lot of freedom to actually optimize the cavity design because the wall losses are often not the major concern. You actually can afford to 
increase the wall losses, and optimize your cavity shape for other constraints. One prime example is our Cornell ER injector, which hopefully you've all seen. If not, take a tour, right? I think tomorrow tours, which has again a first choir module and then beam lines, at least that's how it looked like a while back. Now it looks somewhat different. And in this machine we have run very high currents, continuous currents up to 75 milliamps or so. And at that point, about half the AC power taken from the grid goes actually into beam power. So it's a very, very efficient machine. I have two slides on superconductivity, so all the theorists don't listen. Um, so if you go to law of temperatures, these electrons start to form Cooper pairs. Right? There's some binding energy. It takes two times this gap here to break a Cooper pair. And because of that gap, these Cooper pairs, the electrons, can move without resistance, at least in DC currents, DC fields. In air fields, that's different because there you have the offsetting fields. And these Cooper pairs, they have inertia, so the screening isn't perfect. The field penetrates somewhat into the superconductor. And if you're buffed or Kelvin, which we always are, you have the unpaired electrons, the normal conducting ones, they also oscillate back and forth, and that causes some losses. That's all described very nicely by the BCS theory, which tells you that the BCS surface resistance scales as frequency square, because the more things jiggle around, the higher the losses. And it depends exponentially here on temperature, because the lower you go in temperature, um, the fewer normal conducting electrons you have. So the surface resistance drops with temperature here until it hits what we call the residual resistance. That's some leftover resistance, which is even there at zero Kelvin. So there are also two terms, the BCS part, which is temperature dependent, and then the residual resistance here. In terms of scale, this is 10 to minus 9 ohms. This is 10 to 8 ohms, minus 8 ohms. So that's typically where we run nano ohms. Normal conducting kappa is 10 milli ohms. So there are also magnitude here in terms of surface losses. So that's great. Um, where it comes from? Yeah. There are multiple contributions. Um, there could be normal conducting stuff on the surface. Mostly for a well prepared cavity, this actually, as I will show you, comes from trapped vortices. So when you cool down, there's some ambient field to trap some of that. And these trapped fields, the vortices, they oscillate in the air fields, and that causes losses. There still might be one nano ohm or so of other stuff we don't fully control. Could be also bad oxides on the surface. Is that my, my four minutes? Uh, you are, yeah, six minutes away. Okay. Cool. All right. So, curves we typically show are quality factors versus field. So, we like to go high because that decreases the quadrant cooling power. We like to go high in fields because that gives us more acceleration per length. So going in this direction is good. When we make this cavity, this is actually quite some process. It starts out with sheet metal of niobium, typically, for current cavities. So we stamp these, we trim them, we weld them using electron beam welding. And you can see that tomorrow during the tour. We do all kinds of high temperature bakes, chemical etching, low temperature bakes. So there's a whole recipe here. Part of that is black magic. We do assembly in a clean room. And then at the end, we test. So the last few minutes, just a few slides about the history of SIF cavities. It all started in 1908 with liquefaction of helium, which we need right, to go to low temperatures. 1911, discovery of superconductivity. And then 50 years later was the first idea to actually build cavities out of a superconductor. So here's the original paper from 1961, which actually proposed to use these kind of cavities for acceleration. Then in 1964, there was the first high-Q SIF cavity, just a few years later. I couldn't find any pictures. And then a year later, there was the first actual electron acceleration by an SIF cavity over in Stanford. A bit later, late 1960, early 1970s, were the first actually cavities of niobium, before they used lead, for example. Um, and actually, that cavity is a pretty high-frequency cavity. Um, 9 gigahertz, a slight big or so, a tiny thing. But if you look at what they got, it's pretty good for today's standards. 310 to 10 Q, that's where we are right now, even though this is much lower free temperature, 1.25 Kelvin. Maximum fields here corresponding to 15 or so megawatts per meter. That's pretty good. 
we can do better now, but for a first cavity, that's quite impressive. Early 1970s, the first real SAF accelerator, again at Stanford. Here's a picture of this machine. That's a cut of cavity or section of a cavity. I think overall they had 55 cell cavities or so, quite long. 1.3 gigahertz, if you're wondering where the frequency comes from, this audio was 1.3 gigahertz, same thing we're using today in most of our accelerators. Much lower fields, 2 megawatts per meter, instead of our 20, 30 megawatts per meter we use now. The issue came actually from the shape of these cavities. Then in the 1970s, 1980s, first SIF cavities in high-energy physics accelerators, both at Cornell here. That was at the Cornell Electron Synchrotron. This kind of cavity has two halves. Machined out of solid niobium. Again, if you do the tour tomorrow, I can show you this thing. And this is the first cavity in actually an electron storage ring. Again, here at Cornell. So over the years, we actually learned how to go from low field, 3 megawatts per meter, to really all the way to the theoretical limits in niobium, somewhere around 45, 50 megawatts per meter. And more recently, we have learned how to bring up the quality factor. So here's some earlier curves of these Q versus E curves. Not so high in field, strong Q slopes, but by improving the preparation, we actually went to higher fields, higher efficiency, especially at high fields. And with this increase in performance, there was a quite rapid growth in application. What's shown is the total voltage stored as a function of year. And you can see it's exponential growth over the years. So the really early days here, this is CBAF, Newport News, SNS, flash neutron source, and then FELs and Heinrich colliders. So in the future, what we need is even higher efficiency, going beyond what the state of the art for quality factors, at least in all of magnitude, we'd like to increase that. That's our goal here, of the center of one of them. And that's really important for many machines. So by, you can do this by either improving Q, improving the operating temperatures, going to higher temperatures. Both of them will give you smaller cooling power needs. And the way to do this is actually to optimize the first few nanometers, tens of nanometers of the surface. Because even though these cavities are built out of pretty wall, thick wall uh, niobium, three millimeters thick or so, the field only penetrates a few 10 nanometers. So the first few 10 nanometers or so, they determine the performance of the cavity. And I will leave that part for later on. Questions? So fortunately for electrons, they're basically um, highly relativistic at even lower energies. So there it doesn't change much. But you're right for ions, especially heavy ions. Um, so there we actually use different kinds of cavities. And you're right. So there the timing isn't perfect, but it's good enough of a certain range of velocities. So you go from one type of cavity to the next type of cavity to the next in the machine. So by either change the cell length, or for even lower velocities, you use these low better cavities I showed you which look quite different, these half wave, quarter wave resonators or so. But you're trying it, you have to match that. So that's why ion machines, proton machines are actually far more tricky to build. They have more types of cavities than just the electron machines. Yes. And, uh, but what else does it depend on, like the surface resistance nope. related to something else? Just, just the shape. Just, just pure shape. Yes. Or not absolute shape, it's just relative shape.